You have a multi-stage amplifier, let's say. So it, it's a big box, right? It has an input and it has an output and it has multiple gain stages. So somewhere down in the middle of this chain, there is a voltage, let's call it VI minus one. And then there's a dependent current source, let's say. It can be a transistor or something like that. Some GM times a VI minus one, right? And then that's driving some load. In general, it could be some resistance R1. I'm showing it to ground because I'm looking at the AC part of the response, the small signal model. So there's an R1. And then this produces the next voltage, VI, that goes to the next, next stage. So this is one of the stages in the middle of this chain. Right? So now if you look at that, what is the gain due to this stage by itself? The gain due to this stage is simple, right? From here to there. What is that gain? Yeah, negative GMR1. So you have that gain for that stage, that part of that. But it has an overall gain. So now imagine that I introduce a branch here, an extra branch in parallel with this one. I call it a, consisting of a resistor RZ and a capacitor CZ. OK? So how would my gain change? Well, how would my DC gain change? Would my DC gain change at all? No, right? Because at DC, that capacitor is open circuited, it's not going to do anything. So that's not going to change. Now, what will happen to the transfer function before and after this is introduced? Think about it. There's an old, or let's call it before and after, right? The H of Z, so what is H of Z? HZ. So we can define, there would be a time, uh, there would be a transfer constant H of Z, right, in those calculations. What does H of Z mean? It's a transfer function with that capacitor infinite valued. What is that? What is the new gain? How would your overall gain of this amplifier change? Yeah, so it, this becomes negative GM R1 parallel RZ. Right? So HZ, is it fair to say HZ is going to be H0 times RZ over R1 plus RZ? Because HZ, H0 had this term in it, right? Now that term got modified to this term, which is again negative GM R1 R2 over R1 plus R2. So the ratio of the new HZ, which when you, this is shorted, to the old transfer function HZ over H0 is going to be the ratio of these two. Does it make sense? So we know what HZ is in terms of H0. So now, what can you say about the new transfer function? So, or after, let's say, after introduction of this thing. Um, well, let's say. Let's write it this way. I think I wrote it. Yeah. Um, so I want to write it as H of after, HS of after, basically after introduction of this thing, in terms of H of S before, before introduction of that branch. So this is, the, what I want to say how introduction of this branch will change the transfer function. Right? So how would it change it? Well, I have now a new term here. Now, in general, this is pretty hard to say because you know, there would, this would change a bunch of time constants. We don't know what B2 and B3 and all the other things are going to be doing. But we also discussed this concept of uncoupled poles and uncoupled time constants, right? What was an uncoupled time constant? It was something that could be factored out of a polynomial. And what was the test for it? The test was to see if shorting and opening of any other capacitor will have an impact on this. Now, if there are no interstage capacitances, like a capacitance between this stage, a previous one, or this stage, and that next one. So this is the assumption we are making here, right? Then, shorting, shortening or opening of capacitors and inductors elsewhere in the circuit is not going to change the resistance seen by this guy, right? Do you agree? Therefore, this becomes an uncoupled 
This will introduce an uncoupled pole and an uncoupled zero. Do we have a new pole when we do this? Yes, right? So what, what is the time constant for that pole? What is the tau, tau z zero? You null the independent sources, this current source disappears. What is the resistance seen by CZ? R1 plus RZ, right? So it's R1 plus RZ times CZ. And so that's the time. Point. So the new transfer function is going to be the denominator of it. It would be 1 plus R1 plus RZ CS. And the numerator would be the ratio of HC over H, H0 divided and, and times tau z. When you multiply these things, you see that this term and that term cancel. We are calculating A1, right? You remember A1 is going to be HZ or tau z0 HZ due to this one. So that would leave basically RZ CZS. So the introduction of this branch introduced what? A0 at exactly this frequ the frequency of the time constant of these two. This is one standard way of introducing a zero in the transfer function. A parallel branch to ground, right, that carries a current. Um, and and the, the zero is actually easily calculated because the zero is essentially the product of these two. And the pole, it introduces also a pole that's basically determined by CZ and R1 and RZ. So a lot of, so basically this introduces a pair, 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 pair of pole and zeros. And this is good because you essentially have two degrees of freedom. You can place the pole and zero to some extent independently by choosing the RZ and CZ with respect to R1. Because if their product determines the location of the zero, but their values in conjunction with R1 determines also the location of the pole. Now, this is a useful thing. A lot of times in compensation of amplifier, when you want to stabilize an amplifier, you do this a lot of times. Because what happens is that you are looking at this time constant and you have a pole that's bothering you. You say, well, you know what? I can put a zero on top of it and I can have the, the other pole happening at a higher frequency so I can shift, the, cancel that lower frequency pole and put something on a higher frequency. Or you can do the opposite depending on whether it's a lead or lag compensation or something like that. We can talk about this later. Right? So, but you can create this pole zero pair that you control. Now, there's, a simp there's another way to see this, perhaps simpler, is that if I define this as this voltage as Vz and this current as Iz, right? Vz is, can be written as Rz Iz plus the impedance here, which is basically Iz divided by Czs, right? That's the voltage drop, right? This is the impedance of the capacitor times its current, which is Iz gives you the voltage here. And this is basically this resistance times the Iz that gives you that voltage. So it's the sum of these two voltages, Vz. So I want to set this to zero. That's the meaning of a zero, right? At that frequency, it's the frequency at which it forces the voltage to be zero. It's shorting it to ground. At one complex frequency, this is not a sinusoidal frequency necessarily, right? It's a complex frequency S. At, what, at some complex frequency, this can be forced to be zero, meaning that it's, this branch at that complex frequency shorts it to ground, meaning that nothing gets to the output. It's the definition of a zero. Okay, so if you, if you solve for this, you can easily see that S has to be Right? You cancel this, you move this to the other side. You get that frequency. So it's a left half plane zero at that frequency. That's another way to think about it. That's one way you generate zeros. 